When I was a boy, about eight years of age, I stood in the high street of Glasgow, barefooted, bareheaded, cold and hungry, and I gazed at each passerby and wondered why they did not help. My aim is to remove a number of children who are at present in workhouses. Children who, under existing circumstances, will eventually, in their turn, produce an offspring of physical and mental weaklings. As an adult, I had a strong desire to go down to the children of the streets and lead them from a life of misery and shame to one of usefulness and honour. Yeah, many of these rescued children can be saved to the church by being permanently removed from their early surroundings. It is all done for the sake of the child and in the sacred cause of religion. We will immigrate them. Bring them up in an atmosphere of energy, endurance, and cleanliness. We will produce a class of farmers, men whose strength is rooted in the soil. They will be a credit not only to our race, but to Great Britain and the Empire. Only those who are of good character and good health are said. Above all, they come filled with a love for their holy faith and ready to take their place in the life of their country of adoption. In the late 1800s, churches, charities and religious orders in the UK began to take young people from poor families and children's homes and send them overseas. The dream was to give the children a better life in a new country, and some did grow up happily, but there were other forces at work. The people in this film are actors, but the stories they tell are true. I don't know much about my father, but I think my mother was single and unable to look after me. I was placed in a children's home. It was her intention to come back for me when she got herself established and was able to care for me and herself. A priest came in and asked us who wanted to go to Australia. All the children raised their hands. We didn't know what Australia was. We thought it was just down the road. We were just excited because we wanted to go somewhere. We were told that we'd be able to pick oranges off trees and ride to school on a kangaroo. I remember someone coming into a room and calling out my name. I don't remember ever being asked if I wanted to go, but the next thing I knew, eight of us from the home were chosen. We were all lined up in groups. One girl was mixed race, so she was taken away. It was called the White Australia Policy. When my mother came to see me, she was told that I'd gone to Australia and that it was none of her business. The journey on the ship was great. There were a large number of children from all over. There was plenty of food and we ran around the ship having fun. I felt sad throughout the journey as I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to my father. Each boy was given a suit and a little suitcase. But when we got to Australia, the suits were taken from us and we never saw them again. We were given gifts. The newspaper was doing an article about our arrival. The toys were just for show. If you had a brother or sister, some of them would make sure that you were separated and put into different homes. On my first morning, a tall man in a black robe told all of us boys to stand in line. I was slow, and this man grabbed me by my arm and belted me with a heavy leather strap across my bare legs. I asked one of the nuns who were looking after us when we would be returning home, and she hit me a clout over the ear and told me to get back in line. My job was to polish the huge verandas on my hands and knees. They had to shine like mirrors or you'd pay for it. We worked on the farm and the construction of a new building. We had to do all the work in our bare feet. In the winter, it was freezing. They gave us old bags to put on our head while the rest of our body got soaked. There was never enough food, and all these bugs used to live in the porridge. I'd sit by the wood pile to get the crusts which had been cut off the bread in the adults' dining room and thrown out. Bars were once a week, unless you were at the bed, 
and then you had a cold bath and were strapped for not being able to control yourself. We weren't known by our names, but given a number. I was number 134. One of the staff would prowl around the dormitory at night, wake up a boy, and take that boy to his room. I was always relieved when he'd walk past my bed and shine his torch at another bed. When I told the nuns that I was having my period, they called me a filthy swine and gave me a few pieces of old sheet and pins. We're meant to be under the care of the Australian Child Welfare Department. They may have spoken to the people in charge, but they never spoke to me. After about six months, a nun told one of the girls who was crying and homesick she would never be returning home. None of us would ever be returning. Over 100,000 young boys and girls were sent to countries across the British Empire and the Commonwealth. The very last group of children were sent to Australia in 1970. The people who set up these child migration schemes began with the best intentions. But within these churches and charities that no one thought to question, there were men and women who abused their power to take advantage of the vulnerable young people who were sent to them. I lost my identity when I arrived in Australia. I've been searching for answers all my life. Why were we sent? Have I family? Who gave these people a right to break up families and ship them thousands of miles away from their homeland? I know I'll never find proper answers. I try to put my past behind me where it belongs. But... The memories never leave me. I have nightmares every night of my life. I relive my past, and I am happy when the daylight comes. Today, across the world, children and young people like us are still being made to suffer by men and women abusing their positions of power and trust. In this story, most ordinary people didn't question or speak out. You can. <laughs>